Um, yeah, your folks at the back, if you can come closer, that will be wonderful. Seems. <laughs> so this could be an intimate um, chat. Great. Um, we have about 45 minutes with us. I have a series of questions for, uh, for the panel here. But to get started, um, for today's conversation, there are, in my mind, there are really three key words, rural, uh, financial inclusion, and rural transformation. Um, and while most of uh, us joining here would know uh, this, this rural market that we are talking about, this is roughly about 900 million people. Um, about 300 million people have access to internet, which is to put this in context, the population of US is about 330 million. Uh, those are the number of people in rural India that have access to the internet. Um, the incomes, monthly incomes range between 286 rupees per month to about 13,000 rupees a month. That is really the spectrum uh, of people that we are talking about um, uh, when we talk about rural markets. Um, I won't take more time um, and set context. We have a stellar panel. I think to, in total, we have experience of about, about 50, 60 years on this panel working in, in the financial. Okay. And therefore, I'll, I'll quickly get to the, to the questions. Um, we have, Hari, I'm going to start with you. And okay. I'm going to um, ask you to tell us what is You've been collecting some data on uh, rural households. Um, if you could quickly tell us about the impact of um, um, financial policies yeah. on rural households. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, here to this uh, to this uh, uh, event. Um, so uh, uh, I have approached financial inclusion. I, myself, and uh, a couple of my colleagues at IM, uh, Ahmedabad, we have approached financial inclusion with a view to understanding what it does to households, what it does to individuals within households. Um, what the government has been talking about is, is welfare, that is converting households into spending units. So it provides welfare, and and uh, and households are expected to use that welfare to spend on few items, mostly dictated by the government. So that essentially means that the household's horizon of planning is immediate. If you are a spending unit entirely, your time horizon is is almost immediate. Kya karna hai, Okay. Just simply too many things on my hand here. Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully this won't fall off. Yes. Okay. No, that's that. Uh, I'm I'm all right. Yeah. So. Um, right. So if if we view households as having to react, rural households in particular, as having to react entirely to uh, uh, to welfare policies as designed by the government, then essentially what we are doing is that you are converting households into those that need to be planning for the future to those that are actually engaged in immediate expenditures. So our worldview has been, as part of this team and as part of the research program uh, that we are uh, currently in the middle of at IIM Ahmedabad, is to try and explore the extent to which financial inclusion, namely uh, what the central bank has been doing in this country, how that financial inclusion can help individuals and households into expanding or extending their planning horizon. Essentially, we would like to, we would like for the households and individuals, women in particular, to associate ownership of bank accounts or fintech products. Uh, with participation in labor markets and income generation. Therefore, uh, linking ownership and use of bank accounts with, with, with incomes, with planning for the future, rather than uh, immediate expenditures. 
So in that context, we are trying to explore what central bank policies have done to this thing called financial inclusion. Uh, we, I will also explain to you later when Supriya asked me about what fintech products have done to financial inclusion. So the central bank has been at uh, dealing with financial inclusion in rural India for a long, for significantly long time. And they have in place a number of policy arms. And one policy arm is the bank correspondents. And it is quite astonishing what bank correspondents have done to incentivize. I, I use the word incentivize very, very carefully. For me, the term incentive means that it, 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 it essentially reflects the cost of not doing something. So if you do not own a bank account, there is a cost associated with it. Only then owning a bank account becomes an incentive. Otherwise, it is not an incentive. Right? Uh, the reason why women are, uh, are, are attracted to PMJDY is because it is through PMJDY that uh, they are able to access uh, welfare benefits. Uh, PMJDY is not, according to us, financial inclusion. Uh, financial inclusion is something that is triggered through central bank policies. Financial inclusion is intimately linked to income generation. It is linked to economic activities of households, not consumption activities of households. So if you, if you look at these bank correspondents, the role of bank, what, what they have done, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the things, for example, uh, uh, you know, the impact of bank correspondents uh, on uh, account ownership by women in rural India, in remote villages, that is, uh, you know, how do we define remote? I mean, you know, if an average, uh, uh, the distance to a, uh, to, to a branch, to, to a bank branch is more than 15 kilometers. That to us is remote. Um, it's 42%. Uh, average impact of a bank correspondent is, is, is up to 38%. Huge impact. Yeah? And, and it is quite astonishing uh, that, uh, that, uh, that this is happening and, and, and uh, uh, in, in public discourse, in public policy, this is not being addressed adequately. And how these banking correspondents can work with fintech is something that I can that I will talk to you about a little a little later. Uh, a banking correspondents as uh, uh, providers of financial literacy. Uh, if you look at one of the RBA circulars, it clearly points out that these banking correspondents should work with the panchayats. Uh, in other words, it is it is it is, it will be amazing if the banking correspondents are able to participate in Gram Sabha meetings where financial inclusion and literacy is becoming an agenda in the Gram Sabha, members of the village are able to participate and are able to access information about banking. It, 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 they're able to understand the benefits of banking. They're able to understand the benefits of using bank accounts. Uh, it'll be uh, something spectacular. I mean, that's where I mean, the RBI circular says it, uh, but we, are, we don't seem to be talking very much about it. Um, uh, it does other things. It, it, it empowers women, financially empowers women, owning a bank account, using a bank account effectively. That's another finding that, uh, that I will quickly talk to you uh, uh, about. Uh, Supriya, just give me a half a minute. Um, there are economic outcomes, significantly measurable economic outcomes, uh, due to ownership and effective use of bank accounts. He, firstly, it financially empowers women within households. The share of decisions taken by women within the rural households increases by up to 5%. Uh, these are not just statistical regularities, these are econometric regularities, they are structural regularities that we have estimated using our, uh, using our household data. The, one of the most astonishing things that bank accounts do is what rural households are able to do in reaction to adverse shocks. Rural households are exposed to a number of shocks. Yeah? Uh, you know, there can be climate shocks, there could be health shock, there could be all kinds of shocks. So they undertake coping mechanisms to, uh, in response to these shocks. If you have households where women are owning a bank account, specifically, uh, households where women are owning a bank account, there is up to, one, one, there is up to a 2% decline uh, in the need to sell assets as a coping mechanism. 3% decline in, the, in, 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 in having to use starvation as a coping mechanism, reducing consumption as a, as a, as a, as a coping mechanism, right? And, and nearly a 1% decline in having to borrow from money lenders. So it, proliferation of banking, proliferation of uh, economic activities as a result of owning a bank account makes rural households less vulnerable 
and and financial inclusion therefore plays this kind of a significant role in economic development of rural India. Uh, so I will talk about this when. Great, hmm. thanks, yeah. thanks, Hari. Uh, powerful, I mean, findings, uh, powerful numbers that that you've been able to share with us. I'm going to come to you next, Munish. Um, extensive work that that you've been doing with Bharat Banking, particularly in the rural markets. Could you tell us about? Okay, uh, could you tell us about? Um, uh, some standout um, things that you see in rural markets, some lessons that, that you've uh, been able to integrate in, in how Access Bank is delivering financial inclusion? Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Supriya, uh, for getting me here. So, for us, you know, at I Bharat Banking, uh, we're trying to connect the dots in the semi-urban and rural ecosystem to deliver credit and uh, liability products to these markets and to these customers in a seamless digital manner, which is cost-effective. So essentially, uh, deposits and accounts, and but and also on the other side, loans, which include farm loans, microfinance loans, etc. And I'll take it take up from where Professor left, and I completely agree with him. And uh, the increase in financial inclusion leads to very powerful outcomes. And I am at this end. Uh, he's he's at this end with with theory, and I'm at this end delivering this into deeper markets. And I have several experiences which I can go on, but I'll narrate a couple of them. A few things which stand out. Uh, for us when we look at these markets. The first is that, you know, there is a, uh, you know, in Bharat in particular, it's for an institution, for us like us or a bank or a in other financial institution, very important to take a very customer-centric view of, uh, of, the, of your segment that you're trying to service because you cannot take a product or a business-centric view because you will fail miserably, right? Because if you go with the with multiple product proposition to the customer and every time you do a uh, you know, fulfillment, et cetera, it's just not possible. So take, you take a customer-centric view and say, here's the customer, here is life cycle, and here's where I start, and uh, this is what's going to happen to this customer over a long period of time. And today, data makes that possible, and that's the second thing. The second thing which stands out is that you know, a lot of, in, in, the, in the current scheme of things, the schemes that uh, Professor talked about and the policies that are uh, going and on and the, and the way this entire ecosystem is being invaded by a number of uh, uh, opportunity seekers who can go and we think we can business which can make money in this market, a lot of data is getting generated in the process. A lot of digital outreach has begun. Uh, and, you know, and we work with uh, several such partners, uh, uh, one of which is uh, Agri uh, Inputs Company, uh, Bayer. And Bayer has a, in a set of uh, uh, you know, uh, better life farming, uh, uh, dealers or uh, you know uh, agents or something BLF agents and they take a number of services and they deploy or sell those services in those in those uh, farms or to farmers in the adjoining areas. So what we see there is that once you start getting a lot of data about these customers, coupled with some other data or, or technology that you can get about the farmers or you know uh, or households from sometimes some something around set satellite imagery about farms and stuff like that, where you can better underwrite a customer, you actually can go and provide more and more credit to these guys. And once the credit becomes, and we were talking, Pavan and I were talking just now, if it's sustainable, then it stays. If it's not sustainable, then it dies out, because then you will lo make, make losses and you come out of it, and then you are just out of it. So data becomes very important. In fact, we did a workshop with uh, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, along with World Economic Forum, uh, sometime back, where we, wherein we said, how do you create a, a civil equivalent of data for all farmers or farm kind of activities in the country. And I, th I think that's a big opportunity. Uh, Department of Financial Services apparently is already working on tagging every plot of land or and every farmer to that plot of land and trying to track their productivity, et cetera, which will enable uh, financial institutions to go deep in there and start funneling those services to these uh, people. The third thing that I, I, I realize in these markets is that sitting here in BKC, uh, we don't have a view of what could be happening in deep markets in this country, right? Because we are all digitally savvy, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, you'll be shocked to know as you or see as you go deeper into these markets, these markets are not, you know, as they 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 are indeed as digitally savvy as possibly all of us are. The digital services, appreciation of digital, appreciation of bureau, appreciation of data, appreciation of technology, smartphone, et cetera, use of it. If a BC is there in that market, how to you know deploy or use those services to get fin you know financial inclusion for self, etc. It's deep in there. So as a result of which, it becomes immensely possible today to st to stitch solutions 
working with multiple parts of the ecosystem, collecting all the data, et cetera, and funneling those services into these, into, for these customers. So some of the experiences that I've had, I mean, I, uh, you know, I've seen, I was in deep Kanchipuram, uh, you know, and we saw, we met a BC professor there, uh, and this gentleman was working with CSC as a village level entrepreneur. Okay, and uh, he was providing all the government services to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the adjoining or neighboring villages, etc. And what what I saw there is that this guy is an ex cognizant engineer. Okay, he was an ex software engineer. He was deep into Kanchipuram, some hundred kilometers inside Kanchipuram, providing digital services to to villagers in his neighborhood. About seven, ten, fifteen, twenty villages. Everybody now goes to him for getting all the government services, getting a passport or a, or a PAN card or a voter card, et cetera, et cetera. And all the services on the banking side, you know, standing there, I actually, uh, in deep Kanchipuram, I made my Airtel bill payment for a bill which was due in uh, Bombay, right? And, you know, and, and every, and today, all the banks in those adjoining areas are actually guiding everybody to go to this one guy, saying, don't come to the branch, just go and get services from this guy. And this guy is a, a one-man army, and he's dealing with, and he's giving us loans. He's helping people, you know, come out of their financial, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, poverty, and helping them improve income, etc. And this, these kind of networks are helping, you know, um, change this country uh, completely, uh, you know, dramatically. And that's the pipe on which we want to ride and say, can we just go in there and work at this level and at this level and at this level and see how do we connect these supply chains? to help these guys come out of their income. We also did some study on microfinance borrowers as to over a long period of time, how do these microfinance borrowers, are they really changing their lives by taking credit one after the other? And we saw a large percentage of customers, close to 45, 50, 55% of customers, they take first credit and the second credit and the third credit, and then finally they become an, a, a micro enterprise. Mm -hmm. Now we, I met a few women again in Kanchipuram and these ladies are, you know, uh, contract workers for making Kanchipuram silk saris for nearby manufacturers. So they get one order, they take a loan, uh, buy the working cap, uh, buy the material, and produce one sari. And then five saris you can do, you know, and you know, and over a period of three to five years' time, you are coming out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And you know, and that's the revolution that that is happening on the ground. So it's quite uh, inspiring, and it's quite uh, uh, you know, uh, game changing for our country. Absolutely, uh, Munish, and there are a couple of things that uh, that you are, um, I'm very happy that you're underscoring the need for uh, the industry to build customer-centric solutions, to be able to ride on existing and build for existing supply chains and digitally enriched supply chains. Uh, very, very valid. Uh, Pavan, I'm going to come to you next, and, and as, as the foundation, you've been doing extensive work and supporting fintechs in, in various forms. What has been your and the foundation's thesis behind supporting fintechs building for rural markets? Thank you, Supriya. So I think the first first question to look at, and you, and you went in and said this extremely well, uh, is that it's very difficult to reach the people in the rural areas, especially if you're in the frontiers and the oases, and therefore, it's also very expensive. So the traditional uh, models of viability don't really work. Uh, 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 technology has gone and changed that, is changing it, can change it even more. Uh, to be able to get to those uh, people who are left out, out right now, by the use of uh, uh, of tech, and I'll give you an example of this. So let's take the car case of Aadhaar, right? So if you about five years ago, if you went to a telco or a bank and said, "Hey, I want to do a KYC of a customer," the cost was upward of seven hundred rupees. That's about ten dollars. At at ten dollars, all the poor people are unprofitable for <laughs> financial institutions. Nobody would want to onboard them, right? What happened, uh, Aadhaar entered, and the cost of KYC, uh, because of auth and, and authorization and, uh, uh, and authentication, dropped to about 10 cents. Right? Suddenly, everybody is profitable. As a result, you see 460 million new bank accounts opened in the last about six, seven years. Right? Unheard of around the world. In spite of that, we still have about 20% of adults in the country who don't have an account, right? so we, which is another about 240 odd million, but we also have the largest um, number of uh, inactive accounts. Right. 
So the so the question now is that if you've got an account which 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 a regulator says that it has to be in a regulated entity, how do you utilize that to serve the needs of the people in that location? Right? So having a a bank account is a good starting point. It's not the end point. It has to be able to be able to use the services which can come attached to the account and stuff like that. So our our um, our belief is that um, fintechs as a world which take you on the bridge from analog to digital, right? In a way, you start with the assisted services and then you know uh, kind of graduate to to doing stuff yourself, but. That's the world. So it reduces the cost, it, it increases reach, it increases access. And when we started to work in this space a couple of years ago with IIM Ahmedabad and CII Eco, we, did, we realized that most of the venture capitalists were not investing in this field. They all, they all wanted another uh, food delivery app or a, or, or a cab ride hailing app and stuff like that is because of quick returns and, and what the uh, urban market kind of wanted. But as you rightly said, 900 million people is a lot of people to include and, 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 and hopefully uh, they won't stay excluded for long. Um, so, and we started and, and there have been some interesting results, right? Uh, after we started some about 9% of um, of of funding in India in, in fintechs now go to folks at ProPoor, right? Which is great because starting from a zero to reach at just about ten percent in in under four years is I think phenomenal. Uh, the next phase will come. The other is that uh, the amount of the of, of the fintechs who can serve the serve the lower income uh, markets has been limited, right? We've seen in our cohorts at CIA about 42 odd startups have been able to serve about 34 million odd people, right? And uh, and about 20 million odd from them are women, right? So that's that, that's a huge number. It 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 hits two markets, right? One is at the bottom of the pyramid, and the other is a highly excluded other segment of women, right? Who are who are uh, excluded for the fact that one, the products are not right. Two, uh, the access is, uh, is not equitable and, and not, not uh, close enough. And the third is that they, that, that, that they believe there's no need. Right? But I firmly believe that unlike all of us in the room, the poor have a very complicated financial life. Right? So they do a lot more with a lot less. Right? Uh, in terms of trade-offs, I would probably do a trade-off if my daughter asked me that, that I want a new phone and I want an iPhone. I said, why do you want an iPhone, right? They probably make a, a such several such decisions every day. Right? So they, they, their lives are complex, but we are not addressing them. And there are several reasons why we are not addressing them is because, one, we don't see any startups emerging from rural areas. Right? So if if... If, if people in the cities are imagining what people want in the rural areas, it's not going to work. Right? So we have to have, have people who come from there, who understand that space, who've lived that experience to be able to solve for these things. Um, so I'm, 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 I'm glad that at least now we are seeing some more startups which are emerging from tier two, tier three, and four towns, but that's still not enough. But, but I think we, we need to do a lot more to be able to get there. So I'm going to stop there. Okay. Let you on. Thanks, thanks, Pavan. And on that note um, of um, fintechs being able to help leverage data, help improve access, I'm going to ask you, uh, Munish, are, uh, are you co-innovating with fintechs and what could be mechanisms for uh, fintechs to work with incumbents and, and sort of large bodies like yourself? Yeah, so I was thinking about FinTech, and we do a lot of work with a number of FinTechs uh, uh, in the ecosystem. See, essentially, what does a FinTech do, I mean, I, which a bank cannot do, right? So you are uh, you are there, you're providing the services, et cetera. So there are three, four things, uh, utilities or uh, benefits that this brings. One is that they work in, in, it's not possible for one institution to work on multiple fronts and try to do small, small tests with seg segments and micro segments and still micro segments and then find out a scalable uh, you know, solution in there. 
So you, these number of these fintechs which working across the country, they choose their own small ecosystem and they work in there. Somebody's working in farm equipment, somebody's working in um, uh, milk, somebody's working in uh, silk, somebody's working somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. So they bring the entire thing to a point where a bank can then plug in and start providing the fuel for their growth, et cetera. So that's one thing. Second thing they provide is reach. Uh, you know, uh, reach, uh, digital, uh, or through some other uh, media which is uh, which is which has a deeper reach and which can flow deeply into these market which are po possibly a regulated entity can or like a bank cannot reach so easily that's point number two uh, point number three is that they bring some data about the customer they bring the data to a point it evolves to a point where you can start intelligently make use of their data right so uh, you know and the data collection becomes in aggregation it becomes a bit larger for us the banks to start making some sense out of it Otherwise, you know, you go deeper into this market, takes possibly that much longer. To pursue, but once you have that data, you can start analyzing data and to start doing something with them. Now, once you have this stuff, then what you do is then you say, how, what do I do now with this entire set of reach, data, and digital delivery mechanism, et cetera, et cetera, is that you start doing some tests in the, in the ecosystem. Say, okay, I will plant a few products here and there, and I will start doing some small tests. And we see how the test behaves during the you during a short period of time. And if the test works and test gives you some learning, et cetera, then you qualify that, uh, uh, that test with a, with a broader solution and then you deploy it into a larger ecosystem and that ecosystem could be an ecosystem within that FinTech or you could deploy it to multiple other ecosystems which are of similar nature. Because now you have some understanding of this, of this one ecosystem. You know what kind of data leads to what kind of outcomes. Etc. So you take it from one side and then you start deploying it on the other side and you start making it scalable. So number of players we work with, uh, you know, uh, we, there are some which only give us reach. There's some where we, we are working in where they get a lot of data and we are able to do micro transactions. Uh, you know, somebody like a, a number of fintechs, but I'll name a few. Let's say a fintech like Stell Apps, uh, there's a, uh, you know, which is which is doing something, dairy where they, they have a system to collect milk from all these uh, touch points, et cetera. So the farmer gives the milk, he expects money immediately, so you can start giving micro credit on a daily basis, et cetera. Technology enables that, right? So that's a reach, uh, that's a how technology delimits uh, transaction because uh, the benefit of technology is it doesn't depend on, you know, some any constraint. If you don't have a constraint of putting more people and doing whatever, it can, it just deconstraint. You can keep doing as many transactions as you want. Or something, we work with a, FinTech, let's say, like a, a agri-tech FinTech in that zone, somebody like a, um, a company which, which, which we have invested, like Agrim. Agrim is a company which is a B2B agri-input marketplace where they sell these products to, uh, uh, you know, these products to retailers in these deep markets. So they source for them and they sell to retailers in deep markets. It's an online Amazon, so to say, of agri-inputs. So once you get into that ecosystem, then you start financing that supply chain. And, you, and then you start doing some work with them. Or you work with some other fintech, somebody which is a, doing a B2C kind of work. So they're selling, they have shops, physical infrastructure, and they have a digital platform to sell products to farmers, seeds, fertilizers, uh, whatever else goes into farming, et cetera. So those guys then start working with us for their cash flow needs or their, their customers who come and buy from them, giving them credit on the, on the go, et cetera. Or somebody like a, a fintech like Rupik, which is in gold loans, uh, again, gold is a massively unleveraged uh, uh, or hidden asset in this country. If you were to just unlock the amount of gold that's lying in our markets, it'll, be, it'll bring in so much of capital uh, into the into the into into flow. Right, and that you can make that work because today, and Professor talked about it. You know, to keep them away from the clutches of money lenders in the local level, gold is the first port of call because you don't need you don't even if you don't have a credit history. Even if you don't have something else, you can actually start building it with a gold loan. So you start working on that side and seeing how you deliver uh, deeply to these guys with only one, uh, you know, uh, caution, and which is this that, you know, these customers are very vulnerable in these segments, right? So the, it is the responsibility of the provider to ensure that you think of those vulnerabilities and, do, and so that those vulnerability, vulnerabilities don't get exploited to their disadvantage. Right, so and you don't make undue money because at some point and then you'll have to stop doing it. There'll be discontinuity, right? So those are my few takes on fintech. Sir. Absolutely, I think um, a lot of uh, interesting models, and we're seeing validation of some of these models out there. Hari, I know you've uh, your teams brought back data on the impact of fintechs uh, on financial inclusion. Could you share some insights sure. with us? Sure. 
But I again want to start talking about ownership and use of bank accounts. And I, I just want to make two remarks, and uh, it's based on the, uh, on the observations of my two of my colleagues here. Uh, you see, the, 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 uh, the underlying factor is, is economic activity. Uh, sorry, the, the underlying factor here, the, under, the core factor that drives just about, that, that drives and ought to drive just about anything in the rural sector is, 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 uh, is the economic activity. So uh, there is something called the night light data. I mean, as maybe some of you are aware, uh, the night light data is basically satellite data on, on luminosity uh, of, uh, of uh, different places. So we, we wanted to explore the relationship between nightlight and ownership of MGN reg based bank accounts, nightlights and PMJDY accounts, nightlights and bank accounts. And uh, it's quite astonishing that uh, the, there is hardly any relationship between nightlight. The luminosity levels are actually lower when you increase the density of MGN reg based bank accounts or even PMJDY accounts. There's hardly any economic activity there. These guys are consuming whatever is getting transferred uh, to, their, to, 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 to those accounts. Owning a bank account implies an underlying economic activity, whether it is farming, whether the use of technology in farming, whether uh, it is, uh, uh, these are micro enterprises, the, the, the sari making business that you're talking about in Kanchipuram is, 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 is an astonishing uh, example of what financial inclusion ought to be doing uh, in terms of triggering economic activity. I, I just wanted to throw that out a little bit. Uh, you know, I want, uh, rather, I wanted to get it out of my head. Um, it was kind of eating me a little bit. Uh, the, the, the proliferation of fintech is, is an example, is an illustration that there is capacity building happening in, in, in rural India. Uh, without capacity building, fintech is, is, is uh, you know, or whatever a fintech product, uh, it will be mostly used for uh, redundant activities. Yeah. Now, uh, the fact that uh, fintech activities are proliferating, there is evidence to suggest that it is leading to capacity building. What is that evidence? I mean, let me. Uh, 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 so, it, this is based on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a couple of rounds of surveys that I carried out um, uh, in, uh, across 30 villages in UP. We are not talking about Maharashtra or Karnataka or Tamil Nadu. It is rural UP. Yeah? So, so let me uh, explain to you what is happening to, uh, uh, to households in rural UP as a result of proliferation of fintech uh, in, these, in these parts. So uh, fintech products, proliferation of fintech products, the first thing it does, uh, it leads to an increase, a 6% increase. Uh, Nothing related to fintech uh, products. Unrelated to fintech products, there is an incentive provided by proliferation of these products to uh, open bank accounts. What does that mean? Uh, what could that mean? Uh, it could only imply uh, from what uh, uh, my colleagues have been talking about, this fintech is triggering economic activity and, and generating income streams. And if you generate income streams, and, and if households are part of those income streams, then there will be an incentive to own and operate a bank account because that enables them to plan for the future. So owning a bank account is a, a, a owning and operating a bank account, savings account, for example, is, is, is an indicator, one of the indicators that households and women are able to uh, significantly plan for future activities. You know, increase savings, increase uh, expenditure on human capital, uh, increase expenditure on girl-child education, nutritious food consumption, any number of things, right? Uh, it, it is doing that, right? Uh, that is one, one, one activity, right? Uh, women that own fintech products, not just use fintech products, that own fintech products and are members of SSGs, for them, uh, you know, uh, there is a 5% increase in ownership of bank accounts. The five net of SHG, net of fintech, five percent increase in ownership bank account. It incentivizes savings uh, behavior. Yeah, the probably the most astonishing finding that we found uh, in our in our uh, in our research was that the savings rate, not savings level, the savings rate of women, rural women, increases by five percent. This has got huge, huge macroeconomic implications. 
uh, imagine boosting savings rate through technology, not through whatever you did in macro policy or whatever you did in fiscal policy. Through technology, through incentivizing women to use technology and linking it with the formal banking process. The core here is the banking system. Without the banking system, this whole thing collapses. We can't, I mean, you know, you digitize, you, you digitize certainly, but you do it in the presence of a very strong formal banking. Not, you don't digitize in the presence of fiscal policy. I mean, that's disastrous. You digitize in the presence of monetary policy, which is central bank, right? Uh, it's just a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, There is something called relative deprivation, right? Women, uh, women are relatively deprived in rural India. How so? So uh, 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 the, you measure relative deprivation by uh, whether women are able to spend on their own clothing. Yeah? Uh, whether uh, uh, women, for example, are able to uh, uh, spend on, uh, on girl-child education, their own children, right? Who is in control of those expenditures, right? It's not just the level of expenditures that matter. Who controls those expenditures? Now, the proliferation of fintech products, use of fintech products, reduces relative deprivation. Uh, we are talking about UP, please understand. Rural UP is what we are talking about, which has been touted as, you know, backward, whatever, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of hearsay baloney that is going on, right? Uh, so, so uh, 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 we actually find that there are ways in which you can overcome these kinds of hearsay uh, casual empiricism, right? I mean, so, so uh, if you, if you, uh, if you uh, increase the, the, uh, the, the levels of technology, if you increase the level of competence of rural women, uh, deprivation comes down. Education expenditure uh, increases. In education expenditure for girl children increases, right? That's only possible if the fintech products, use of fintech products, are related to the formal banking system. You see, they have saved part of their income, as a result of which they are increasing expenditure on girl children. And why are they able to save? Uh, the fintech products are giving them an opportunity to access markets, to access information, to be better able to access credit, to be better able to use credit, to be better able to use, uh, allocate uh, uh, income streams. Yeah. Uh, Expenditure on nutritious food increases astonishingly uh, by close to 12%. But, but, but one point I have to make here uh, uh, is this complementarity story between fintech and formal banking. And there is a huge degree of complementarity and there is a need to boost this complementarity. What happens when, when a fintech product is created? There is always a fintech entrepreneur behind that. So the fintech entrepreneur finds it useful to sell that product, to explain, to explain the product. We call it reducing transactions costs associated with use of the product. Uh, uh, you know, people who are likely to use those products know about that product, benefits of use of, of that product. The banking correspondents have not been incentivized to do that. That's exactly what they have to be doing. So, so uh, uh, you know, if, if banking correspondence uh, policy, policies related to banking correspondence are strengthened, and they are empowered to engage in extension. Uh, uh, you see, there is one thing that, uh, uh, half a minute, uh, just a second. Uh, you see, this thing I wanted to uh, point out, uh, this, I don't know, the second point. There are, uh, some panchayats are reserved for women, some panchayats are not reserved for women, yeah? In reserved panchayats, the effect of bank correspondence is quite interesting. Yeah? Suppose women are interested in accessing information about bank accounts and that panchayat is reserved. They are more likely to talk to the elected representatives about accessing information. And one of the RBA circular is suggesting that the bank correspondents work through the panchayats to expand financial literacy. So what is happening in reserved panchayats? In reserved panchayats, Banking correspondents are becoming far more effective in attracting women towards formal banking. 1.6% increase in, uh, in ownership of bank, uh, bank accounts by women relative to their male counterpart within the same village. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, you know, so I, 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 I kind of wanted to talk to you a little bit about the complementarity and leave it, uh, uh, leave it at that. that uh, there, is, there is a need for this complementarity and, and that uh, promotes 
deepening of fintech in the in uh, in, in in rural India, uh, widening the use of fintech in rural India, uh, and uh, you know uh, strengthening uh, financial inclusion uh, uh, through formal banking system. Great, thanks, <laughs> thanks, Hari. Um, and in the interest of time, we just have the last couple of minutes, uh, so I'm going to do one round of closing thoughts. Uh, we have spoken about, at least in the last 40 minutes or so, we've spoken about uh, things that are happening well, that are, and we spoke about data, we spoke about customer-centric products, we spoke about this complementarity between incumbents and fintechs, the impact of financial uh, inclusion policies as well as fintechs on uh, rural households. But uh, the question I do want to ask all three of you is what would it take, I mean, given all this is happening at the pace that it is happening at, what would it take for rural transformation to unfold? And I want to start with you, Pavan. Rural transformation is quite big, right? It's large in a country like ours. You talk about uh, 3.29 million square kilometers, uh, 900 million pop, uh, at least 55% of them as women. Uh, it needs to change, right? Uh, so let's start with what what the initial. Uh, so we should step back and look at what are the rails which are needed first, first to to get us there. Uh, from my last uh, conversations, I heard that about some about forty thousand odd villages out of six and a half lakh villages India has don't have connectivity yet, right? So all the all the people staying there will not get connected if if you're going to do only fintech. So it needs a digital world where you have some physical stuff and some digital stuff, and and you need to do that. I think the second thing we spoke about is is the right kind of products and the and the reach and distribution. I, we still believe, I still believe, a lot needs to be done to get the rural distribution right. It needs to be viable and sustainable. It needs to be high quality. It needs to be able to serve all sorts of people. It needs to be served, including the women, which uh, we are still far away from from there yet. I think improvements have happened. India is like the BC industries moved from, you know, about uh, about a million odd agents to about. 3.4 million agents in the last two years, which is great, but the quality is still suspect. Uh, there is not enough transparency. You, you can't, you, if you still go to some BC agents and, the, uh, and you want to do a withdrawal of 100 bucks, he'll charge you 10 bucks, right? So that's a 10% for all the poor people, which is really steep. And now I don't know if that is a 10 bucks uh, across, uh, across values or only for 100 bucks or whatever. So I think that's the other question in terms of transparency. Uh, in terms of communication and awareness, in terms of the digital divide, um, in terms of, 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 of languages and literacy, uh, you know, the role upcoming of, of language in terms of, of dialects like a Bhojpuri or a Maithili, where, where you have a lot of uh, poor people there and who can't read or write and, those, and, and they, they aren't supported on phone. Uh, the, uh, the role of voice, can you start doing of voice related transactions. So there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done and, and we are all in the in the process of getting there. I think the one thing which I will I'll highlight, which still needs to be done amongst all these other things, is that there's a huge imbalance in between uh, you know the compact and nimble uh, startups and the large banks. Right? And and what we see is that these startups uh, fail to deeply engage with the banks for several reasons. One, they have small teams, and they have to engage at multiple levels in a large bank. Uh, and you know, from, from engaging to doing technology, integrating with the CBSs, there's a whole lot of stuff. And then there's also this thing about you know, underwriting. Right? A fintech, uh, you know, a standard kind of a fintech will tell you, I've cracked the code. If you give me only, the, only 30 data points, I'll tell you if it works or doesn't work. And our bank will tell you, you know, traditionally I've been doing 400 data points, right? How do I transform my, myself from, a, from, from such a large data point into 30 data points? And the capacity within the bank to change. I think there needs to be a, and I'm glad that you guys are working on this, uh, uh, Manish, but not everybody's doing it. So I think there needs to be a, a very kind of sustained effort to get the uh, um, uh, fintechs and the large banks to work together. Uh, otherwise, I think we are uh, not going to be as successful as we as we should be. 
Uh, so I think that is one um, nudge that I would have for almost everybody to do that. And, uh, and I think even the fintech piece, while they all do excellently well on technology, they don't have somebody who is into business development. Right? So, you, so you do need somebody, while you are, are doing all the great engineering and, and the experimentation on the ground, there needs to be somebody who needs to own that job of doing business development. I think you need to equally walk from the fintech side and the bank side to be able to meet anywhere in the middle to be able to go you know, out and create the magic, as I call it. It's not transformation, but magic. And I'm, and I'm, I'm telling you, the world is looking at us. It's because we are doing so much on technology as a country, that the world is looking at us for models which work. And we should not be disappointing them. Thanks, Pavan. Munish, same question. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, we don't ask 400 data points. We ask, <laughs> we ask far fewer uh, data points to do a transaction. So, I think uh, for me, uh, rural transformation to happen or will happen in future is not the thing. I think rural transformation is happening and it is here to stay. And I don't think anybody can prevent that from happening in the future. Because if India has to realize its ambition of going where it wants to go, this has to be carried along. Right. Now that's point number one. Point number two, I think a number of things that can be done to accelerate this transformation, right? Because it's already happening in some way or the other. The realization at multiple levels in the government and, uh, and to that there's a need to this. And on the private side, and realization at multiple levels of uh, enterprise scale, the need to uh, diversify or need to go into the deeper markets and find more profit, different profit pools is already exists. So I think that it is an uh, understanding that is, uh, that is already there and it will continue to move in that direction. Uh, I think, uh, to my mind, accelerating participation of uh, private enterprise uh, is, is, is one uh, key thing by the government I, and there are several things that one can do. Uh, putting the data construct together and bring it all together at a one point so that which can be made use of to underwrite customers better is the second point that that i think will help third is this entire you know encouraging this deepening of uh, uh, financial services of bc network and through other stuff and you know and having a self regulatory kind of a model there which can uh, keep taking shape and keep taking services deeper and deeper and deeper it will of course evolve over a period of time but i think that's something that is uh, likely to happen Fourth, I think the need to uh, look at the entire s setup very differently, by both by the government and by the, you know, the use of vernacular, uh, the customization of policies and processes, which these guys understand, customization of technology, voice, for instance, and a couple of other things that one could do, education, uh, creating, uh, you know, uh, incentives or opportunities for youth of this country to remain deployed there or to remain employed there is very, very important, right? Because if they leave those cities, if the villages, et cetera, for cities, and if they don't want to stay here, this entire entrepreneurship is not going to, uh, uh, going to uh, come together. And lastly, from my standpoint, from my standpoint, you know, since we deal with a large number of vulnerable, uh, uh, you know, customers or people in this ecosystem, you know, always putting them together and creating a stronger core is always better. So in promotion of collectives, and you know is very very important, and making you know what happened in in Anand in Amul is something that has happened to multiple such commodities or products in the country, right? So creating those collectives is very very important. The collectives and I went to a FPO in uh, uh, near uh, 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 this place, uh, Tutikorin, uh, you know, uh, Thuttukoti as it's called. So I was in, uh, I went to spend two days only with an FPO to see how an FPO works. And because there are thousands of them, and, and I, I was trying to find a figure, trying to figure out how, do, how does an FPO work? Is, it, is there a sustainable model or not? And I was so, imp I met up with uh, about 10, 12 of them in that area. And there's an organization which is actually doing contracts out there, with, for providing consulting to set up FPOs. Mm -hmm. And I, that thing has just got to become bigger. Right, because once you're a collective, then your ability to negotiate, uh, market, create market linkages, you know, get deploy technology, uh, you know, give advice, etc. The behavioral uh, thing aspect also changes because it's a collective behavior. Uh, the credit behavior changes because you're part of a larger group. You don't want to be a standout in that stuff, etc. I think that promotion of collectives, I think, is very, very important, and I think that is what will take it forward. Great, thanks, thanks, Munish. Uh, um, Hari. 
some quick thoughts on what would Sorry, it take? Uh, maybe, maybe one word or two words. Uh, Mike. So, Mike. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, the point that I have been making, uh, which, uh, which my colleagues have been echoing from different angles, I think. So there is a supply and demand side uh, uh, story here that triggers uh, role transformation. I am approaching role transformation from the point of view of what households and individuals must be doing. So the, the point, the single important point that I want to, to make here as to what will trigger rural transformation is that if individuals and households in rural India are in a position uh, to respond to signals, they're incentivized to respond to signals, right? Climate change is a signal. Are rural households in a position to respond to signals and take decisions? Yeah? And how will they be able to respond to these signals? in the presence of technology. That is where the supply side story comes in. Yeah. Uh, households, rural households, have always functioned in the presence of huge amounts of moral hazard and adverse selection. Moral hazard in, is inferring information asymmetry, not knowing about things. That's moral hazard. Adverse selection, poor design. A, a banking products are poorly designed. FinTech products for the longest time were poorly designed. So what is the whole point in having these things in the rural country side in the, in the first place? And how do you expect, how do you expect uh, the, the, the uh, rural households to be able to respond and react to incentives? Why were cooperatives successful? They were designed effectively. They reduced information asymmetry about what it takes to participate in these cooperatives. We have not done that with FAOs. Yeah? Uh, we have done that effectively with these cooperatives because that cooperatives have been around slightly longer. The story, the business model of a cooperative is slightly more, uh, uh, you know, uh, appealing to the rural uh, uh, rural households and the policymakers because that kind of, uh, you know, still uh, is smacks of uh, old style socialism. Don't talk about profits. The moment you talk about FPOs, ooh, profits come into into the picture. So you don't want to talk about FPOs. Because we still think that if farmers make profits, there is something bad going on. Yeah? Uh, we still want to talk about farmers as anadatas and not marutis as car datas. Which is quite astonishing. I mean, why would the farmer want to be handing out uh, his fruits and vegetables that he has grown and cultivated with as much care as, as, as building a car? Why do, you, why do policymakers expect that to happen? Why do they expect this of rural households? And not of the urban households, not of the urban entrepreneur. Yeah? When, when that starts happening, a rural transformation happens. And that is likely to happen if you leave things to the rural households and don't get them to do 100 different things because, you know, uh, your politics dis uh, dictates that. Uh, kindly don't do that. I mean, if you do that, you're essentially going to be talking about the same thing 100 years later. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much um, for the patient listening. Thank you, panelists. Thank you very much.